right. Yeah. So thank you very much, Jason, Amy, for inviting me. Uh, as Jason said, I'm a postdoc in the Korean lab where we study protein structure function relationships. And while we're mostly an experimental lab, I ex almost exclusively work on computational aspects of these problems. I look at essentially, uh, I start with the structure and then study their dynamics to figure out how their function is, affecting, uh, is affected. Um, and I've been using Exceed, uh, I think it's been about 10 years now. Uh, since I was a graduate student, uh, my graduate lab uh, used uh, Exceed resources almost exclusively for all their research. It was a purely computational lab, uh, a theoretical chemistry lab. And uh, then when I moved here to the Korean lab, uh, we started looking at proteins, which uh, I'll, uh, as I'll explain to you, require large amount of computation to simulate their dynamics accurately. And so, uh, We've been uh, using Exceed resources uh, to do most of our uh, simulations here. And uh, I'll go into, so we use Savio a lot uh, to sort of set up our simulations, but ultimately these systems are very, very large. And so uh, we end up needing to uh, use resources like the uh, machines that are part of the Exceed consortium. So uh, I'm just uh, going to uh, go into sort of three things over my talk. One is what is molecular dynamic simulations? Basically to uh, give everyone a sense of why we need high performance computers to actually run these simulations. Uh, and so in the first part of my talk, I'll just cover both these points about what uh, what molecular dynamic simulations are and uh, how and so how why we need uh, high performance computers to run them and how sort of uh, uh, and sort of uh, then I'll spend like a little bit of time talking about how we actually did this in one uh, particular uh, set of proteins uh, and so I don't know what the format for questions is but uh, I'm comfortable with like people just jumping in and asking me questions or asking me questions at the end, which are either will work for me. Um, so uh, basically uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, based on Newton's second law, where the force is proportional or the acceleration of a molecule, uh, which is how fast it moves uh, in a certain time it is dependent on the force but it's also dependent on the direction. So for a force always has a directional component. So if you apply a force from the left on this little black sphere here, it's going to uh, move in the same direction as that force. If you apply it, uh, if the force applies downwards and pushes it downwards, that little sphere is going to move downwards. So if we know the force, how much force you're applying on a molecule or an atom and the direction, you can predict where this particular atom is going to go in a given time period, uh, both its position, uh, both the direction and how fast it's going to go there. And so we use that idea or that's sort of the basis on which all of molecular dynamic simulation sits. And we use it, uh, essentially the forces we are looking at are forces between atoms. So if you consider a system with three atoms here, you have the pink square, a green, a, a pink sphere, a, a green sphere and this blue sphere. And so, so the pink sphere has a negative charge, the blue sphere has a positive charge, just like a little battery. One and has positive charge, one it has a negative charge. And there's like a little neutral uh, bit in the middle. And they are connected by rigid bonds. So they, these, uh, when there's one bond, it, this red sphere can sort of, or the pink sphere can move uh, around the green sphere, but it can't really break away and go float off. Uh, it's a little harder for the blue sphere to do that because it has two bonds. But if you have two of these molecules in space, for example, 
then they can interact with each other. And we know that the negative charge is going to repel the negative charge, like charges repel like charges, uh, and the positive charge will repel the positive charge, but opposite charges will attract. So the negative charge will attract the positive charge. And so uh, if we can calculate the force that this molecule exerts on the second molecule and vice versa, as a result of all these interactions, then we can say how these two molecules are going to move with respect to each other over time. So if we say, if we started this position, these two molecules in this position, then at a very small time point, t, uh, uh, delta t time, uh, uh, time point in the future, we can see that the this second molecule has rotated a little bit. So it's, you know, this negative charge is coming a little closer to this positive charge. It's also moved a little closer. And then we can, uh, and then we start again and say, okay, from this point, what, uh, how do they interact with each other? Again, the like charges are going to repel each other and the uh, unlike charges are going to attract each other, uh, the other molecule. Uh, and so at a very small time point forward again, you can see that these two molecules are going to be like closer together. And so we can, uh, so we say that this is how these molecules will move over time and so what we simulate is essentially how all these atoms in a protein will behave over time under a given set of conditions. And uh, of course, this is a very, very simple system that I've been talking about. The proteins we talk about look something like this, which is uh, some, uh, this is a protein with about 6,000 atoms. Uh, uh, it's render uh, and they interact with each other so that they form these ordered structures. So you, you have a, a whole series of proteins that interact with each other to form these helices or this region here where they form, they're sort of oriented in lines with each other. So they form these sheet like structures. Then you have these other little, uh, and these order, uh, these sort of ordered regions tend to move very slowly. It, it, they have a lot of interactions with, with each other. And so you have to break all these interactions for this region to sort of unfold. And so, uh, and something like this, which is basically a loop just floats around forming uh, loops. Uh, and this region will move around a lot, but this region tends to be very, very stable as it is. And so, when we look at uh, when we're interested in looking at how something like this moves now uh, as i said we can determine positions at very small time steps uh, or by moving the system forward by a very very small time step so the time step we use is two femtoseconds and so if and then we move the system forward by another two femtoseconds, and we just do this iteratively over and over and over again. Now, if we had need, and we need, uh, this is a system, as I said, with 6,000 atoms, and we need to do this. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said, regions, some re uh, these regions, if there are structural changes that happen in this protein, in most proteins in a cell, these structural changes happen on microsecond time scales or millisecond time scales and very long processes in terms of sort of how long it takes to compute these. So if you're moving your system forward two femtoseconds at a time, it takes you a very, very long time to get to one microsecond or one millisecond. Uh, and this is not even a very large system in uh, terms of like uh, the proteins we study. Um, so, uh, the pro uh, systems we study actually end up looking something like this, which is, this is a system with four proteins in them. It's like a pink one, a cyan, green, and a yellow. It's surrounded by water. Uh, uh, there's like ions, so the blue ones are sodium ions, and these uh, pink spheres are chloride ions. So this is a system which, uh, and I'll go into detail about this a little bit. Uh, it has about 200,000 atoms, 
And so we're trying to calculate the interaction between every atom in the system and every other atom in the system. And so that's a lot of, uh, and uh, a lot of calculation to get move you forward by two femtoseconds. And so we need to do this a lot to get to a microsecond. Uh, and so that's where uh, uh, resources that exceed come in because we just do these calculations on uh, computers like Stampede. Uh, if we have some systems that are smaller, we run them on uh, bridges uh, and Comet, but uh, for the moment, uh, a lot of our systems end up being, uh, uh, Stampede ends up being the most efficient place for us to run them. Uh, and so basically what we do is we just split the system uh, into like smaller squares and we sort of split, split the calculation across uh, nodes on Stampede. So uh, this particular system, as I said, has 200,000 atoms. And when I ran the simulation, I was running it either on like eight nodes or 16 nodes, uh, depending on the queues. So sometimes I could get eight nodes faster, uh, even though it takes less time to run the same calculation on 16 nodes. There were, you know, there were more pe people using them. It's easier to, or it takes less time to just run it on eight nodes. Uh, I ran six individual replicates of the simulation, uh, uh, three under one condition and three under another. Uh, I'll go into that in detail in a little bit. Uh, so that basically meant that, and these were all going on simultaneously. So that meant that I was using between 48 to 96 nodes at a time, uh, which is a, a much, uh, is like, I, uh, I don't think, uh, apart from resources like Stampede, you don't really have access to that much compute time at one go. Um, it, it usually takes, on Stampede 2, it takes like 30 to 60 minutes, depending on whether I'm using eight nodes or 16 nodes per nanosecond. And so uh, I ran these simulations for like oh, a microsecond and a half, and it took me something like four to six weeks. So, uh, which, uh, I have to say, you know, when I started running these simulations uh, like uh, 10 years ago, I was running systems with 50,000 atoms and it would take me like something like a few months to get to a hundred nanoseconds. So I, I'm i like in awe of how much compute power I have at the moment. It, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and so, uh, so the, so that is sort of how we tend to, uh, so that's uh, sort of the, how we use Exceed. Uh, uh, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time now talking about uh, this particular system and what we uh, ran these simulations for. Uh, so as I said before, my uh, lab, the Korean lab basically studies uh, the structure function relationships of proteins. So all proteins have a three-dimensional structure. They, they're made up of thousands of atoms that almost, uh, I mean, and most of these protein uh, atoms interact with each other to form a particular shape. And these shapes are tied very, very uh, tightly to their functions. So if these function uh, and proteins are like workhorses of the cell, they perform in catalysis, they perform transport, they transport molecules from one place to another. They serve as like gatekeepers to allow molecules into your cell, et cetera. And everything they do, they do basically by uh, changing their shapes. So if they have one shape, they're on and active and they can perform catalysis or, you know, they uh, like if they're on the cell and are, act as gatekeepers, they're open. Uh, or if they're, uh, if they're, off, then sort of the uh, channels on the cell surface are closed or the shape of the protein as an enzyme is different and it can't actually perform catalysis anymore. And uh, so if we know the shape, then we say, okay, this is the shape of the protein or the structure of the protein when it's in the on state. And this is the structure of the protein when it's in the off state. Uh, what does that tell us about how it functions? What happens if you introduce a mutation that changes the shape? Suddenly it gets locked in this on state or it's off state. And uh, a lot of the proteins 
I work with are part of this sort of signaling cascade, which is sort of, uh, uh, or uh, which basically means that there's one protein that sits, this is like a model of a cell that's like the cell membrane that's outside the cell, this region here is inside the cell. So there's one protein that sits on the membrane. It's usually, there's just one of them, it's a monomer. And when it binds to this particular little molecule here, it becomes a dimer and then it becomes, it's on. Uh, so it can't function as a monomer basically. And when this is on, the next partner in the pathway gets pulled and it binds to the RTK on the surface. Uh, this, uh, when uh, SOS is bound to the RTK, it changes its shape. So it activates RAS, RAS in turn activates RAF and so on. So you have these series of proteins where wh when one is turned on, it activates the next protein in the cycle and so on and so on. And the last protein then just turns on cell division and cell growth. And so if any of these proteins uh, malfunction, if they're constantly on, then this pathway is constantly on and suddenly you've got a cell that's constantly dividing and that leads to cancer. So a lot of these proteins are essentially involved uh, in malfunction of all these proteins uh, leads to cancer. So uh, 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 mutations that lead to, or uh, sort of too many of these on the cell surface leads to breast cancer. Uh, mutations in RAS lead to it, that lead to it being on are uh, sort of 20% of all cancers have mutations in RAS. Uh, RAS uh, mutations uh, and, uh, occur in 50% of melanomas. Uh, so, uh, and all of these, uh, or a lot of these just tend to be, you know, there is some mutation that locks the protein in an on state or, or keeps it from turning off. And so uh, if we look at the structure, we try to figure out why this happens, or we try to understand how it functions, how the function changes when there's a particular mutation. So the protein I'm going to talk about today is RAF which as I said, you know, is in, implicated in melanomas. Uh, when we started this project, we didn't know what the protein looked like in either the on state or the off state. Um, and I, uh, uh, one of the, my fellow postdocs actually saw the structure of the protein in the on state and found that it was this complex structure. It interacted with this completely uh, new molecule that we'd never thought of, which is this molecule here called 14P3. And all this does is it's a scaffold. It just holds the two, uh, it holds the protein. Uh, it's like, a, it's, it, it is a scaffold. It just sits there and holds the protein together. And you need two molecules of RAF to bind to each other. Again, it needs to be a dimer to interact. If, it, if it's not a dimer, it just refolds into the inactive state. And so essentially everything that's going on in our structure is trying to keep this protein locked as a dimer so that it can stay active. And so the structure he solved is there are two of these white molecules, but as I said, they're just scaffolding molecules, so they're just both colored white. And then we have two of the protein we're interested in, which is RAF, and they're sort of sitting back to back with each other. And when they're not sitting back to back to each other, they just refold into an inactive form. So they need to be locked together when they're uh, in, uh, in order to stay active. Uh, and so these loopy bits at the end here, these tails uh, sort of very, very tightly attach them to the scaffold, so that was fine. The part that didn't make sense was this bit here, where the tail from one kinase, just, uh, or one protein just came out and sort of interacted with the other. And we call this tail here the DTS. Uh, the death, it's the distal tail segment. Uh, and we didn't know what it did because it, it's interacting right in the active site of this protein. So it's essentially blocking one active site. And so while you have this dimer can function, both of these molecules are active, only one of them can function. And we didn't know why, the, why it would do that. Why did you need a uh, one of them to be blocked? And so, 
what I did then was I just set up simulations of, of this system in one, this molecule here that's coming uh, in this tail from the pink molecule that comes in and sits in the active site of the blue molecule. So that's there. And it, in the second simulation, I just deleted that and said, what happens if it's not there? What happens to this entire structure if it's not there? So I'm just going to show you a very quick movie of uh, this system set up like this. And the second system where this doesn't uh, exist uh, or where the DTS has been deleted, but I'm going to show it sort of going, looking downwards. So we, we can, uh, so we can see the blue molecule and the pink molecule just so, because that's where the interesting things happen in the simulation. Uh, and so you can see that uh, this just stays as it is. It sort of jiggles around for a little bit, but it doesn't do anything. But in the system where that uh, tail was removed, essentially the protein no longer stayed as a dimer. This, uh, these, uh, I've shown the edges of the, where they interact with each other as yellow spheres. So you can see how they just sort of move apart from each other. And this happened over a very long time scale. So, uh, and uh, so what it looks like was, is that this protein functions sort of half as efficiently as it needs to, simply because it needs to keep these two molecules together. Because if they fall apart, then it will just refold into an inactive conformation. And so it says, okay, I'm just going to be half as effective just so I can actually carry out my function, which is pretty cool. Uh, we'd never thought that this protein would function like this. So that's uh, all I have to say. Uh, the, uh, this is the longhorn that Oliver talked about that's on Stampede, which is very cool. I agree, it's very cool. Uh, everybody, I'd like to also thank John Korean and everybody else in my lab, uh, especially Yasushi and JP, who are other people in my lab who Yasushi actually solved the structure that I was able to work on. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Deepti. That was really fascinating, super interesting. Um, um, we'd love to delve deep into that a little further, but we are a little bit pressed for time. And so what I would recommend is we go on to our next speaker now, and then um, and then we'll open it up at the end for people who want to hang out later and, and ask questions. Um, I want to ask some questions. So okay. um, Amy, handing it back okay. to you to introduce the next speaker.